thank you, comrades, who invited me. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, as you can see, the title of my um, intervention today, today is uh, The Internet Between Epistemology and Value Theory. And the complete version of this talk is an article, Old Wine, New Bottles, and the Internet, which will appear in uh, a magazine called Work Organization, Labor, and Globalization. But uh, there is already a non-edited draft of this a longer article uh, on, on, on my website. Uh, in well, now, the discussion concerning the internet focuses essentially on two interconnected questions. Whether the knowledge generated on the internet is class neutral, this is dealt with in part one of my talk, and whether this knowledge is productive of value and surface value, and this is the topic of part two. This is part one, production of knowledge and the internet. The apologetic analysis of the internet are strictly connected to the notion of information society and cognitive capitalism. These are ideological concepts. Information is usually understood as operation information. In this view, information has no class content. This notion reflects and reproduces the myth of the class neutrality of knowledge. The concept of cognitive society is equally ideological. This notion is the way a new labor aristocracy perceives contemporary capitalism. Now, I think that the task is to build a Marxist epistemology or Marxist labor theory of value. And this is what I'm, I'm going to do today. Now, the essence of capitalism is the contradiction between two fundamental classes the owners and the non-owners of the means of production, and thus between the generators and the appropriators of surplus value. This contradiction emerges also in the level of cognition. The ownership of the means of production, and thus the appropriation of surplus value, require a view of reality that rationalizes exploitation, inequality, and egoism. This is capital's rationality. Labor, to rid itself of capital's yoke, must express the opposite rationality, and labor's rationality is, must be based on cooperation, solidarity, and equality. The capitalist, to be such, must produce or let produce a variety of views of reality whose common feature is that of being molded by capital's rationality. The laborers, to resist capitalist rule, must generate alternative views of reality with an opposite class content. Of course, there are more classes and many groups within them, but focus only on the two main classes is sufficient for today's purposes. Let's consider the process of cognition in more details. It involves two movements. They are contemporaneous, but will be mentioned in turn for the sake of exposition. The first movement is from classes to individuals. How do the two rationalities become manifest through the individual's knowledge? For the system to reproduce itself, there must be individuals who rationalize, no matter how, its reproduction. The capitalist, to be such, must rationalize or let rationalize, in a variety of ways, profits and their contributions to the production of wealth. The laborers, <laughs> to resist capitalist rule, must generate alternative views of reality with an opposite class content. The laborers must rationalize or let rationalize, no matter how, profits and the appropriation by capital of a share of the value produced by labor. At this stage of the exposition, the specific features of these rationalizations are still undetermined. However, since classes are aggregations of individuals, 
these pro-capital and pro-labor rationalizations can exist and become manifest only in and through individuals. For example, through specific, unique individuals' conceptualizations. Then, in principle, each individual internalizes in his or her own way the rationality or and the interests of the two class of the class to which he or she belongs. But due to the interaction with other individuals as carriers of other opposite rationalities and interests, each individual can internalize different and opposite rationalities and interests. Thus, individuals give their own specific form to conflicting rationalities. Some of these cognitions can be consistent with and some can be opposite to the interest and rationality of the class to which an individual belongs objectively. The outcome is a kaleidoscope of the pictures of reality, each with it, its own contradictory class content. It follows that the class determination of knowledge holds as the aggregate class level because there must always be capitalists or their intellectual representatives who conceptualize reality through the prism of capitalist rationality, and two, laborers or their intellectual representatives who see the world through labor's rationality. But which individuals express one or the other rationality and how is a matter of chance. <coughs> The second movement is from individuals back to classes. Individual forms of consciousness aggregate into views shared by a class. Since the elements of the aggregation are internally contradictory, the outcome of the aggregation is also contradictory. Moreover, given the internally contradictory nature of individual views, there are many aggregations that rationalize each in, of, each in its own way the interests of a class. The process of cognition involves the clash of rationalities both between and within classes. These aggregations are not the simple summation of individual forms of consciousness because these specific manifestations are by definition different and thus cannot be added. There must be a common element that makes that aggregation possible. This is their shared class content, irrespective of who shares it. This is why classes can reproduce themselves independently of which specific individuals, and thus of which specific individual forms of consciousness share that class content. To sum up, social determination is one realm of reality, that is, the system irrepressible need to express the two opposite rationalities, manifests itself as a number of chance events in another realm of reality, that is, that of the individuals, individuals expressing one or the other rationality, and vice versa, ch chance events in one realm of reality the class content of each individual's knowledge manifest themselves as social regularities in another realm of the persistent manifestation of the two nationalities. It follows that it is meaningless to seek a perfect match between a Weberian definition class, Weberian not, definition of class and individual class consciousness. Here the work of Eric Wright comes to mind as an example of this mistaken approach. But it would be equally mistaken to seek the same perfect match between a notion of class in terms of production relations and individual consciousness. Empiricist sociologists sees forms of consciousness, consciousness not matching class collocation, as deviations and looks for the definition of class collocation and class consciousness which minimize those deviations. The dialectic approach sees in the form of consciousness not matching class collocation the necessary forms of manifestation 
of the two contradictory rationalities and explains how the two rationalities reproduce themselves through those deviations. The conclusion is that there is no cognitive neutral space. Now the thesis of the class determination of knowledge is rejected even by many Marxists, certainly if it comes to natural sciences. It is its use, it is held, and not its nature that is socially class determined. Yet it is undeniable that if the system must continue to exist in a contradictory way, there must be individuals who internalize class determined conditions. Then, their aggregations into shared cognitions, in other words, the production of social knowledge, <coughs> must be class determined before it can be used by one or the other class or by both. So the class determination comes before the uh, different use of uh, a certain type of knowledge. To clarify that, we consider two of the critics' favorite examples. First, Adam is supposed to be class neutral because both classes can use it. But the gun is the product of a society based on violence, in the last instance of the repression given by gun. Ultimately, it serves a class determination need, a class determined need, the need of capital to continue to exploit labor and thus to reproduce itself. If a gun is used by labor, it serves the equally class determined need of labor to resist exploitation. There is a double class determination rather than no class determination. This double class determination is inherent in its production because that production is the expression of a society divided between capital and labor. Then, the use of the gun by both classes is due to the gun's double class determination rather than to its lack of class determination. Similar considerations apply to other classes within class. Now, the production of the gun determines the mental labor needed for that production. Then, if that objective production and its outcome are class determined, and if that mental production is determined by that objective production, the class determination affects that mental labor through the objective production. If the gun is used by labor to resist exploitation, the mental labor conceptualizing that resistance is determined by labor's equal class determined need to resist exploitation. An important conclusion follows. If knowledge is class determined, is class determined, all its constitutive elements are also class determined. This conclusion is valid also for 2 plus 2 equals 4, another of the critics' favorite examples. The critics hold that 2 plus 2 is always equal to 4 in all societies and for all classes. Thus, 2 plus 2 equals 4 cannot be class determined, they hold. But first of all, 2 plus 2 is not always equal to 4. It all depends on what we want to measure and how we measure it. For example, our system of recording the time of the day goes from 0 to 24. Then 20, 23 plus 1 is both 24 and 0. So that 24 plus 2 is not 26 plus, but 2. In mathematics, this is expressed as 26 is 2 modulo 24. Or consider clocks that use the numerals from 0 to 12. Then 12 equals 0. And 10 plus 6 is 4, not 16. Or consider a numerical system going from 0 to 4. Then 4 is 0, <coughs> and 2 plus 2 is 0, modulo 4. But once we choose a module, for example, module 24, 2 plus 2 is always equal to 4. Then what is its social class content? When primitive people did not conceptualize 2 plus 2 equals 4, they used expressions such as many people. Numerical systems, and thus presumably 
2 plus 2 equals 4, were determined by the emergence of exchange and commerce. At this point, the class determination of 2 plus 2 is 4 emerged. The need arose for different societies and classes to measure and quantify irrespective of, the, of what is being measured and quantified. This need was and is common to contradictory rationalities in different societies. But this is not to say that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is not class determined. On the contrary, it is determined by more than one class because it is needed by more than one class to express forms of knowledge with a specific class determination and content. This I call multiple determination. The specificity of multiple determination is that in order to be consistent with opposite rationalities, it must be pure form without a visible class control. This order for 2 plus 2 equals 4, as well as more general for mathematics. Now the critics perceive multiple determination, that is, determination by more than one society or by more than one class, as lack of class determination. In so doing, they make a twofold mistake. First, for them, Class determination implies necessarily the determination by only one class. They ignore multiple determination. Second, they fail to notice that if multiple determination hides specific determinations, it does not cancel them. They continue to exist potentially hidden by multiple determination. This is why a specific determination, for example, by only one class, can emerge again when that knowledge is immersed in a specific mental labor process. But it could not be immersed in a specific mental class context if it had not been abstracted from it to begin with. In other words, 2 plus 2 equals 4 is determined by capital or by labor, and thus it gets its pro-capital or pro-labor class content according to whether it is an element of a mental labor process informed basically by capital or by labor's rationality. Far from, being not, far from not being class determined, 2 plus 2 equals 4 is at the same time determined both by more than one class as a multiple determination, as a pure form, and specifically by only one class one is determined when it returns to be an element of a specific mental labor process. <coughs> now at this point we will deal with the supposed immateriality of knowledge. It is commonly accepted from Lenin to present day workers and authors that knowledge is immaterial, and this is wrong, at least in my opinion. Thinking requires the expenditure of human energy, which is material as shown by human metabolism. More specifically, the expenditure of human energy that constitutes the particle process causes a change in the nervous system in the interconnections between the neurons of the brain. This is called synapsis. It is these changes that make possible a different perception of the world. Knowledge, even if intangible, is material. To deny this means to ignore the results of neuroscience. After all, if electricity and its effects are material, why should, why should the electrical activity of the brain and its effect of knowledge not be material? There is no immaterial basic the workers offers. The belief in the immateriality of knowledge might be the basic reason why epistemology <coughs> has been and still is Marxism black hole. But of course, while synapses make possible change in perception of the world, what is perceived is eminently social. It is the myriad of social relations and processes in all their infinite manifestations that constitute society. Second conclusion, knowledge is always both material and social. Up to now, the generation of knowledge has been dealt with as if it did not require the transformation of objective reality. Um, 
objective reality is the reality existing outside us, outside of our perception of it. But this was only a first approximation. The generation of new knowledge involves the transformation of existing knowledge into new knowledge. It involves mental transformations, but it involves also the transformation of objective reality. That is, objective transformations. Both types of transformations require each other. Then, a labor process is always a combination of both types of transformations. In a mental labor process, <coughs> it is the mental transformations that are determinant. In an objective labor process, it is the objective transformations that are determinant. But both types of transformation are necessary for both types of labor processes. The production of shoes is an objective labor process. It determines a certain condition. On the other hand, the production of a book is a mental labor process, even if it involves, determines, objective transformations, for example, of computers, electrical power, buildings, etc. The outcome of a mental labor process is material, even if it can be intangible, and requires, as a condition of its own existence, the transformation of objective reality. Consider now the mental labor process under capitalism. Some of those who do not own the means of production are hired by capital to produce knowledge. They are the mental laborers. They must transform existing knowledge into new knowledge with means of transformation owned by capital. The capitalists own not only the means of objective transformations, for example, machines, but also the means of mental what are these means of mental transformations? Simply, the means of mental transformations is the mental labor's knowledge. The knowledge of mental labor's are the means of mental transformation. The capitalists buy and thus own the mental labor's labor power. So they own the means of mental transformations. This means that they can decide which knowledge should be produced, how it should be produced, and for whom. In other words, they have the power to define and let solve problems for their own goals, that is, according to their own rationality. It follows that the knowledge produced by mental laborers for capital must be informed either only by capital's rationality or also by labor's rationality. But in the latter case, labor's rationality can become realized only within the contours of, only as shaped and thus denatured by capital's rationality. From the point of view of class determination, this is the essence of the capitalist mental labor process when under the rule of capital. Now, capital fragments the structure of the process of cognition in such a way that the laborers either individually or collectively, cannot reconstruct the overall view of the labor process. The structure of the production of knowledge by labor under capitalism is thus an instrument of labor's domination by capital. This is the hierarchical structure analyzed first by Marx and in more recent times discussed in the Bregerman debate. But in modern times, a new type of labor process has spread itself within the economy. A mental labor process in which some mental laborers are free to express their creativity, subject to the ultimate approval and coordination of the agents of capital. The hierarchy is reduced to a minimum, but it is still there to ensure that those laborers produce surplus value. To this end, those who organize the mental labor process must have internalized the aims of capital and must have made them their own and must have made them their own. I will discuss a specific example of the production of video games later on. There is a feature specific to mental production under the rule of capital. In objective production, capital appropriates the product. Nothing remains to labor. In mental production, capital and thus it appropriates 
the outcome of that process, knowledge. But that knowledge is also retained by the collective labor. Capital appropriates the original, as it were, and the copy remains to labor. However, capital's rationality predominates over labor's rationality because that knowledge has been produced by mental labors within the capital's means, with capital's means of mental production. That knowledge thus has a double class determination in that it is produced by labor for capital. Labor can use it to resist capital's rule, but that resistance remains within the contours of capital's rule. Let us return to the example of a We have seen that it's used both by capital and by labor is not due to the class neutrality of the know-how needed for its production, but to its double class nationality. Labor might have to use it to resist capital's domination, but at the same time it acknowledges and accepts capital's rationality, the use of violence. Labor's resistance remains within the limits imposed by capital's rationality. And now come to the production of knowledge on the internet. If it is produced by mental labors employed by capital, the analysis I have submitted after here applies to you. If knowledge is produced by mental labors not working for capital, it can be informed by labor's rationality, and it can have a contradictory, contradictory social content in which labor's rationality can, but not necessarily, predominate. Then this knowledge can be used not only to resist capital's rule, but also to challenge capital's rationality from the standpoint of labor's rationality. It can go further than simple resistance. It can express and further develop a consciousness through the alternative to capital's rationality. Other domains of cognitive production, for example, some political parties, <coughs> can achieve the same result. And must but the specificity of the internet is that it is a new and specific cognitive battleground between capitals and labor's rationality in their multifarious and ever-changing forms of manifestation. This is the real importance of the internet. Part two. I'm putting forward is based upon the law of value and thus depends on the assumption of the soundness of that law. This assumption has been challenged by many authors, especially in dealing with the internet. But are the critiques sound? As a preliminary, we should, as a preliminary, we should distinguish between two categories of mental producers. The first consists of those mental producers who use the internet to work for capital. They are the mental laborers. The second consists of those mental producers who use the internet for other purposes, for recreation, education, research, etc., while, while not working for capital in their free time. I call them mental agents. They produce knowledge free from the direct Now, the discussions focus on three controversies. The first question is whether mental laborers can produce value on the internet. Now, the answer depends on the ontological status of knowledge. I have argued that knowledge is material. If knowledge were immaterial, how could something immaterial generate something material, namely value? Mental laborers, both on the internet and not, could not produce value and surplus value, and the value theory would cease operating on an ever increasing scale of the capitalist economy. But knowledge is material and thus can produce value and surplus value. But under which conditions? Since value is labor expended under the capitalist production relation, that is by labor, by the laborers for the, for the capitalists, 
Mental labor can be productive of value and surplus value because it is mental labor performed for capital. In this case, the quantity of new value generated during the mental labor process is given by the length and intensity of the abstract mental labor performed given the value of the labor power of the mental laborers. There's nothing strange about this. Exploitation, then, is the difference between the value of the mental laborers' labor power and the value they generate. This value may be incorporated in an objective shell or not. In the latter case, it is the value of an intangible but material commodity. <coughs> Besides these general features, mental production on the internet has its own specificities, namely new labor processes, new positions, and new forms of exploitation. But these specific features do not cancel the labor process's capitalist nature. Let us take the example of the production of video games. Capital stands the structure of this labor process by creating a bureaucratic hierarchy that includes more as well as less qualified tasks. Some mental laborers are highly qualified and must keep abreast of rapidly changing technologies. But they, as well as the other less qualified laborers, must be subjected to capital's control and surveillance. This is what must be <coughs> the function of capital. But the function of capital as a good external compulsion, as in the terroristic assembly line, is ill-suited for the control of a labor process based on the relatively spontaneous creativity of mental laborers. New ways to control labor are less necessary. For example, the laborers must complete their tasks within the limit, within, within the time allocated to them. Then, project managers monitor the developers' progress and pay them and pay them when the project has reached some important points called milestones. But within these limits, laborers are free to take their own decisions and to set the pace of their work. The laborers are controlled by supervisors who have internalized the aims and rationality of capital. Therefore, control has changed semblance. But this new semblance neither cancels exploitation no free labor for capital's rule. Thus, the great autonomy of these highly qualified mental laborers is far from being absolute. Flexible and intellectually and emotionally rewarding labor hides long working hours. American, American online is called an electronic sweatshop. Long and frequent hours of unpaid overtime work and the maximization of labor intensity. It is not only disciplined autonomy, it is also creativity molded by capital. Capital pays laborers to be creative, but this creativity must be consonant with capital's aim and not with the laborers' full and all-round development. New division of tasks emerge. For example, some of the laborers working for search engines analyze blocks both quantitatively in terms of the number of visitors and qualitatively in terms of the comments left by the visitors and thus in terms of the ideas, preferences, etc. Other laborers navigate the web looking for ideas helpful for advertising campaigns, for example, by analyzing chat lines. Still others transform this material in a commodity to be sold advertising agencies. Critics hold that the productivity of mental labor cannot be measured. But consider first objective production. Productivity is measured as a unit of output per unit of capital investment. This is the productivity ratio. This holds also for mental production, say a video game. Consider first the numerator of the ratio. The mental product can be contained in a physical shell, for example, DVD. The DVD produced can be counted as units of output. But the video game can also be downloaded from, the, from one computer into another. The number of downloads can also be counted. They too are units of output. In short, the mental output can be counted. 
Deze is te verbreken. De kaart drukt rechter, je hebt je naam gegeven, kan de computer dus wel, dat gaan. Consider first capital invest in the protocol. <coughs> Deze is fixed cost of capital, computers, premises, facilities, chip factors, assembly plans, etc. Plus circulating cost of capital, raw materials, plus variable capital, wages. Plus the capital invested in administration, pre-sale advertising, and other costs. Let us call this capital A. Secondly, there is the capital invested in the production and sale of the replicas of the prototype. The DVD is to be sold. It is the capital type A for the production and, del and delivery of the replicas, plus the capital type A for the sale of the product, that is advertising, during the whole life cycle of the, man of the man to labor process. Let's call the capital needed for the production and sale of the replicas, capital B. Thus, the total capital invested is A plus B. That is, the capital invested in the production of the prototype plus the capital invested in the production and sale of the replicas. This is the denominator of the product integration. So we have the numerator, we have the denominator, and the product demand of production can be computed. Now, workers' authors hold that the value of the copies of the replicas uh, is or tends towards zero. In reality, the total value of the replicas is given by A plus B plus C, where C is the surplus value generated during the whole life cycle of the mental labor process. The unit value is then given but the total value divided by the number of replicas made. It is directly proportional to the total value and inversely proportional to the quantity of the replicas. Then the capital invested in the prototype is spread over an increasing number of replicas. Now let us assume for the sake of argument that it is obtained towards zero because the number of replicas is huge. Capital invested in the production and sale of the replicas plus the surplus value generated in that production increase as the output increases. The unit value does not tend towards zero. The argument actually by workers authors that the unit value tends towards zero is actually nothing more than neoclassical economics. Which alternatives are submitted by those who deny that the zero value can be applied to the internet? Let's take two examples. For Jody Dean under community, uh, she called capitalism communica communicative capitalism. And under communicative capitalism, it is communication that is exploited, not labor. But the point is that communication is the product of mental labor. Thus, the exploitation of communication is simply the exploitation of the labor's mental labor. Also, Arbitson and Corleone hold that market value theory is not applicable to the internet. For them, value is the effective attachment to a commodity, to a brand. Presumably, the greater the number of customers attached to a brand and thus buying the product, the greater its value. This is the view of the capitalists maximizing their share of the market by manipulating demand, by influencing the redistribution of value. But before it can be redistributed, value must be produced. The source of value and thus of surplus value remains unexplained. Then this approach is useless as an economic theory. For example, the authors should explain how the accumulation or disaccumulation of effective investments can explain, say, economic crisis. <coughs> the second question <coughs> concerns the distinction between product, productive and unproductive labor. This distinction, too, is supposed to be invalid on the internet. 
Let's first consider objective labor. For Marx, labor immersed in the capitalist production relation is productive if it transforms existing use values into new use values. It follows that it is unproductive in the following four cases. First, labor employed in commerce. While, while productive labor transforms objective use values, <coughs> unproductive labor deals with them without transforming them. If one exchanges objective use values, one cannot transform them. Second, labor employed in financial speculation. It is unproductive because it does not deal at all with objective use values. Third, there are those agents who perform the work of controlling surveillance or functional capital. They can be called non-laborers. They cannot produce value because one cannot transform use values if one forces others to perform that transformation. And finally, the labor that destroys objective use values cannot be productive of value because it destroys the specific form use values in which value is contained. <coughs> it follows that the production of knowledge, both on the internet and not, is productive of value because by transforming knowledge, it transforms its mental use value, the use to which a form of knowledge lends itself. Then mental labor is not productive if it theorizes <coughs> the exchange of objective use values, finance and speculation, the performance of the function of capital, and the destruction of, of objective use values. <coughs> then the question is not whether the generation of knowledge is productive or not productive of value. The question is when it is and when it is not. Consider now the mental agents, those who do not work for capital. They too are unproductive, but for a different reason. They are not employed by capital. Think, for example, of the social buttons in Facebook. The mental agents who press social buttons or who discuss a variety of issues on blogs, or who develop technological innovations through their interaction, transform mental use values. At the same time, they provide knowledge to whoever is interested in it. This knowledge is for free, not because it costs nothing. Think of the wear and tear of the computer, of the energy consumed, etc., but because anybody can appropriate it free of charge. On the internet, this is what a specific form of capitalist mental production, the search engines, do through their mental labor. They transform this knowledge into marketable knowledge, that is, they quantify data on tastes, desires, interests, etc. Then they sell this data to other capitalists who then use it to plan advertising campaigns and investments, to evaluate the great worthiness of clients, etc. The capitalists that are more skilled in appropriating the knowledge generated by the mental agent can increase their profitability. Or consider the case of mental agents contributing voluntarily to open source projects on the internet. Since they are not employed by capital, <coughs> they are unproductive. They enjoy great freedom to apply their creativity. However, the individual contributions might require coordination and thus a more or less formal organization. This coordination can be the task of the project initiator or of those programmers with particular skill and commitment to the project. They decide which contributions to accept and give form and direction to the project. Wikipedia is a case in point. The coordinators are often employed by IT firms. Then these coordinators are productive. But who gains in this case? The knowledge so produced can be either appropriated by the firm lending their coordinators or can be free, in the sense that any other capitalist can appropriate it. 
In the former case, the advantage is obvious. <clears throat> By paying only one man to labor, that firm's appropriate the mental agent's collective knowledge and thus turns it into a source of profit. But the firm can lend a coordinator to a mental labor process without retaining the exclusive ownership of that knowledge. This apparent paradox is explained by a series of advantages accruing to the firm's lending mental laborers to this common project. First, the coordinator can accept only those contributions that fit into the firm's techniques and interests. Second, that firm reckons that its advantages from such knowledge are greater than those accruing to its competitors. And third, by observing through the coordinator how the mental agents can be controlled and managed, that firm can draw useful conclusions as to how to control and manage its own mental laborer, laborers. Now, some authors deny that mental agents, what is usually called uh, the users of the internet, deny that mental agents are, are unproductive and following in the footsteps of workerism, extend the notion of exploitation beyond the age labor and into the whole of society. They argue that since all labor is a condition for the reproduction of capital and thus for the production of surplus labor, all labor is productive and capital exploits all members of society non-stop. Two objections can be mentioned. First, to be the condition for the production of value is not the same as producing value. The collapse of the condition of the production into the actual production leads to absurd results. For example, since all labor is also a condition for, this, for, the, for the destruction of capital, change of crisis, wars, etc., all labor would also be destruction of capital. Which one would be? Second, if all labor is productive, why should capital try to increase the time that laborers work for it and reduce the laborers' free time? It is also held that given that the users of mental agents are not paid for the production of value, the value of their labor power is nil. But since they supposedly produce value, all the value they produce would be surplus value going to capital. The rate of surplus value would thus be infinite. But then, first, how can something that has no value, labor power, produce value and surplus value? And second, if all value were surplus value, the users as user would have to live on air. In reality, capital-based laborers for supplying labor power, say, for eight hours per day. <coughs> Suppose the rate of exploitation is 100%, then four hours are necessary to produce the wage goods and thus to reconstitute the labor power for 24 hours, and four hours are surplus labor producing surplus product containing surplus value. The reconstitution of the labor power implies also recreation activities, including those on the internet for, for example, one hour a day. The same person who is a mental laborer for eight hours is a mental agent on the internet for one hour. In her, his free time. Since in that hour, that mental agent does not work for capital, he or she does not produce value and surplus value and thus cannot be exploited. The rate of exploitation, if it were a meaningful notion in this case, would be zero, not infinite. In reality, that mental producer is, explo is exploited not as a mental agent, but as a mental laborer. The third and final question is concerned with the distinction between production and consumption. Again, this is something that the internet would admit absolutely. The argument rests on a new figure, the so-called prosumer. This term refers to a mental agent, a mental agent, whose production of knowledge co-determines the characteristics of an objective commodity that they commission through the internet and then purchase and consume. 
the knowledge produced by the mental agent enters into and shape the character's objective production process, for example, the production of, ca of custom made shoes. The mental agent participates in the design of the objective output, those shoes as the subsequent purchases. However, one thing is to argue that the same person is both producer of a mental use value and consumer of an objective output. Another is to hold that the distinction between production and consumption has disappeared. Time is the key. The purchase and consumption of those shoes follows temporarily its production. The present mental agent is the future consumer. Production and consumption are temporarily distant, even if the same person might be a mental producer today and a consumer of an objective commodity tomorrow. The presumption ceases first in that it cancels time. The prosumer lives in a world without time. It, he is a figure of virtual reality, not of real reality. To analyze the internet, one need not discount Marx very theory. It is sufficient to apply it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kakedi. Okay, so as I've said, uh, we have an hour uh, for discussion. Uh, so we'll raise your hand. There is one. If we have another, we'll take a couple of questions at a time. Here is one. Okay. Tony. May I uh, get a clarification straight away before I ask the question? Objective use value. Can you say a little bit about it? Because it's, it seems to be a key notion. Sorry, Just a second, Tony, uh, he's getting a pen. No Objective use value. When you talked about productivity and numerator and denumerator, you, you, you basically used objective, objective use value. For example, you said that in finance and speculation, labor is not productive because it doesn't, it doesn't have a certain relation with objective use value. I mean, what do you mean by objective use value? Uh, objective use value is uh, that the world outside us, which we perceive and theorize and conceptualize, is objective. Our theorization, conceptualization, cognition of this world outside us is mental, mental, mental process. So that any use value pertaining to objective reality is an objective use value. Yeah, that, that, that helps, yes. So, in your calculation, when you talk about productivity, uh, to give you an example, if you take uh, the distribution of software as outputs, cannot be measured, and large companies know this. What they know is that they can capture enough of what outputs end up being used as objective use values because users use them, so I guess they're objective in the real world. They can capture enough of that value and monetize it to still make an enormous profit. Microsoft, in case of example. So half of the Asia and Africa, in Africa, far in Asia and Africa, vast majority of, of, for example, Microsoft software, which is a capitalist value-producing entity, is not paid for. Yet it is distributed, used, and I think it constitutes objective use value. So while I don't have many sympathies with workers' approach to value at all, and uh, you know I enjoy a lot of your. Uh, a critique of it. I think that you simply, in your calculation of productivity, you miss out an enormous part of, 
objective use value that has been distributed, used, even modified on markets which are really not under the control of capital. And, and, the, and therefore the productivity is valid only in so far as it is monetized as production of capital. But I don't think that constitutes objective reality as we see it, because Asia and Africa do use Microsoft, not to mention Linux, or not to mention that most of our mobile phones run on Android today. And the heart of Android is free software. So although you're right, coordinators are paid by corporations, you're entirely right there, and vast majority of key contributors to Android, to Google software they use, are paid for it and well paid. The number of contributors contributors to the totality of, of what ends up as a final output is enormous. And their labor is incredibly hard, if not impossible, with our today's knowledge of, of how to deal with labor. It's impossible to quantify. Not even labor hours, not to mention the monetary side of it. So I think, yes, it's fine what, what you said, it stands, but it misses an enormous aspect of objective reality when it comes to software. It's simply the theoretical apparatus of Marx as applied by you, simply cannot capture objective reality. That's my comment. Um, <clears throat> I'm, not sure I, I'm not sure I understand completely your, your point, but uh, Microsoft is interested in just one thing, developing new forms of knowledge, <coughs> developing programs, for example, and selling them. Um, other um, contributors to this knowledge uh, are irrelevant for Microsoft. From the point of view of society, uh, of the country's society, uh, they contribute huge values, but do not produce value. And I think here the distinction Marx makes between huge values and value is fundamental. Yes, but what you said objective, that's why I asked you to clarify objective use value. Yeah. So when a piece of Microsoft software is being distributed and used, freely, without monetary aspect of it, in Asia and Africa, in huge quantities, as large as we use it in Europe. Microsoft has no knowledge of it, they're trying to gain knowledge of it by, by penetrating those distribution networks. So, although it has been produced by monetary means and distributed, it ends up being freed into what you would call pirate distributions in Asia and in Africa. So, is it for you an objective use value when it's being used by a pirate copying machine somewhere in an Asian city and people end up using it? Well, uh, the case is similar to uh, a car producer, a motor producer, uh, whose cars are stolen. I mean, uh, um, Microsoft knows that if they invest in so many millions or billions of dollars to produce a certain program, it can be sold for so much money, and uh, they hope the profit will be that much. They also know that there will be lots of illegal copies circulating. Uh, not for nothing, they try every time to uh, limit the scale of illegal appropriation of these programs, but they do. I mean, it, it is impossible. <coughs> But at the same time, my <coughs> I suspect that this illegal circulation of their product is functional for their profit. It does not, in its, in its in and of itself, in and of itself, it does not produce value and surplus. But it is a way to penetrate markets um, so that in the future more people would be willing to buy. Of course, they know this. Oh, yeah, okay. But is it objective use value or not when it's used in Asia as a pirate copy? Because if it is, then it, it goes into output and then it's part of productivity calculation, even though it's not monetized directly by Microsoft. You mean that um, the illegal copies should be added in the computation of the productivity of mental data? If, if they're objective use values, if they're not, then they should be. I'm not sure I can follow the argument. Sorry. Well, you know, is, is, is calculation of productivity purely what monetized labor creates and what gets extracted as surplus value in forms of profit? Is that all we care about? Right? No, wait a minute. Productivity. 
not a thing has to do with use values. Use value produced, divided by uh, but capital invested. But what I'm saying is that in software, the amount of use values that gets objectively used by end user is produced. The amount of use values produced. You mean that? The, well, the, the numerator of the of the ratio. Yeah, because it's copied. It's not like a car. The cost of copying is it is close to zero. In that case, I agree with workers. I don't agree with their analysis, but they do have a starting point of analysis. Okay, I think I see your argument. Um, <clears throat> the um, illegal copies um, should, according to you, should be um, their objective use values. Yes. And they should be added in the numerator of the ratio. Yes. <coughs> but the ratio, and this is the point of your capital, I never thought of it by the way. My first reaction would be that capital is interested in how many copies they make and sell. Yes. Not in how many copies they make and later will be illegally copied. So, uh, from the point of view of capital, the numerator is what they make, irrespective of how many more copies are on the market. <clears throat> from the point of view of society, in my different story, but from the point of that point of view of society is not what drives capital. Fortunately, now I get it, but because you've used the standpoint of labor and standpoint of work, not workers, but standpoint of labor several times in the first part, when you laid out your ontology theory, <coughs> that's what attracted me to say, okay, well, where is the productivity from the standpoint of labor? And from the standpoint of society as, as a whole, like you said just now, we do care about what we end up objectively using as use values, regardless of how capital extracts or not the surplus value from their own monetized yeah. side. So, what, so my question is basically, you know, what is the productivity from the aspect of society as a whole? Okay. Uh, um, just a very short uh, answer. The uh, productivity is measured as a, I think it should be done, as an appropriate, illegal appropriation of uh, those products is in a way um, labor, in a broad sense, uh, resist uh, capital exploitation. I profit free what I should be paid for. Yeah. Um, just a, a couple of questions before that. Just a, a factual point on operating systems. Uh, actually, many of the people who uh, were released by other companies to work on, certainly Linux when it first developed, were uh, released to work on it by companies like Xerox, Apple, IBM and so on, precisely to break Microsoft's monopoly of op operating systems. And I think you're right that initially Microsoft were very happy for pirated copies to circulate to establish, or to try to establish that monopoly. What interesting phenomena recently is the way the internet has been used to try to um, uh, enforce uh, licensing agreements. So if you look at Adobe, uh, another very, very big company, uh, they're moving to a cloud model in which in order to use their products you have to use it through the cloud, in, 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 which means you have to have a license, which means you can't have a circulation uh, of use values. But that's just a brief point. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, first of all, the second part of what you're saying, which I'm, I'm broadly very sympathetic to, the argument which uh, I tend to encounter is an argument about the rent-like qualities of the internet, particularly in the form of advertising. And the argument is uh, always that although Google do employ productive uh, mental labourers to uh, engage in the kind of activities you talked about, they also appropriate a lot of surplus value from other companies by virtue of the fact people have to use Google and therefore they can sell advertising. Um, so first of all, I wonder what you thought, thought about those rent-like qualities attributed to um, uh, profit-making the internet. Uh, secondly, the, the first part of what you're saying, which I need to think about, I'm not sure whether I agree with it, but when you talked about the contradictory nature of class consciousness, of course it brings to mind Gramsci's writings. Uh, the difference between what Gramsci says about contradictory consciousness and what, what you seem to be saying is that Gramsci talks about a mechanism 
uh, by which these contradictory consciousnesses form. On the one hand, the un uncritical absorption of a superficially verbal consciousness from society. On the other hand, uh, he talks about a uh, consciousness that's in, in, implicit in the activity of the worker in his uh, active transformation of the world with his, with his fellow workers. And that introduces a notion of struggle and collective activity. So it's not simply a chance uh, encounter which, which determines the, the balance of their contradictory consciousness. It's also due to engagement in practical struggles and transformations of the world. I wonder if you could comment on that. <coughs> Mine is um, a, a very concise uh, form of presentation of my argument, but uh, I, <clears throat> um, I would certainly um, say that it is on, on, not the formation of consciousness. Of course, has to do with what you do practically in your, in your life, and uh, I only wanted to stress that there is no and there cannot be. And, uh, and you should be, you should not be looking for a perfect match between class collocation and class consciousness. So that the, uh, the, the point I wanted to make is that um, the reason why I become a communist uh, are perfectly contingent. But if I had not become a communist, you would have become a communist. I mean, you are already uh, somebody else, <laughs> you know. And then this. <coughs> So that is, there is this double movement between classes, class consciousness and individual consciousness. Very good. And uh, uh, why uh, so-called no-nonsense Marxists and uh, sociologists uh, think that uh, there is a diversion between the class collocation and class consciousness, I say no, there is no divergence because the point of view is totally different. And these people are actually the agents through, agents through whom uh, even though they do not care what the, the class consciousness they should be carrying, in the last instance, the class consciousness, the, 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 gener necessary, the generation of uh, one type of rationality and of, of the other type of rationality is inevitable. In spite of the, uh, in spite of the fact that who will actually aggregate into these two types of rationality and how is a matter of chance. On the question of that, I forgot it. Sorry. <laughs> um, but they do have the revenue program to be able to start advertising the revenue. Well, I agree with you. Sure. Okay. Sure. It's more or less like um, any. Um, I think there's no difference here between uh, Google and uh, a shoe factory. If they uh, manage through um, advertising uh, to get a share of the market that otherwise would have gone to the competitors I and mean, their profit part, they not only produce that super value, but appropriate a part of the super value from other users. Oh, professional. I recognize you. <laughs> okay, so other questions or comments? Raise your hands. Well, if there's nothing, uh, we can finish up. Uh, and the next, oh, there's one comment. Question. For the lecture, uh, I would like to maybe continue on uh, Joseph's remark uh, about the rent on the on the internet. I believe it's uh, maybe the most important uh, point uh, about the whole thing here, because uh, I'm not, you know, the uh, the grandmaster of Marxist value theory, so I sometimes get lost in all this, uh, you know, this uh, fine tuning of the the, the whole thing. But uh, one thing that I uh, do think that it's actually happening on the internet right now uh, is, and which uh, we can actually see uh, precisely in the video game industry, uh, is that um, the, the the commodities that are being sold, the the, the uh, final part, of the the video game, 
do not have, um, are not sold anymore as, for example, as, as cars. Uh, they, are, they, they have been sold in the 90s, but uh, uh, precisely because of the internet and the, what uh, Tony was speaking about, the privatization of, the, uh, of those kinds of commodities, uh, uh, capitalism isn't able to uh, monetize on them anymore. So uh, I'm not sure how it really fits into, uh, into the value theory that you presented here. But uh, what I think that happens is uh, uh, capitalism introduces rents in the, on the internet precisely because it's not able to monetize on, on the values that are produced. In whichever form they, they, they are uh, finally um, uh, allocated. Uh, you can see it precisely in the video game industry. For, for example, you have uh, today uh, the greatest part of the video game industry is so-called free-to-play uh, video games. They are uh, given for free, and anyone can play them. You never have to give uh, a coin uh, to, to play them. You don't even have to uh, watch the, the advertisements. So you could uh, ask, well, how do they make the money? They make the money by selling uh, uh, the license to play them uh, for uh, specific uh, kinds of, uh, uh, for, for, for example, for specific kinds of characters that we can use or for a specific kinds of uh, 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 advantages in the game or something like that. Basically, also that, uh, that applies for, uh, for, for example, to Google, to uh, especially to uh, Apple, uh, and, uh, uh, and or basically all large, uh, biggest uh, internet companies, which uh, basically only rent their own uh, space. You can't really use uh, their their um, their uh, uh, software, uh, at least not in the potential that uh, they uh, that you would want it to, and, uh, and unless you are being uh, uh, paying the license or the rent to to the software. So, my question would be. Uh, how that apply to uh, uh, to the value theory? Because the product itself, they don't care about it. They will give you the product, back. but if you want to use it, then you have to, uh, uh, you know, it's a full potential for it uh, uh, in the exclamation marks. You know, uh, it's uh, you have to basically rent it. Yeah, I'm sure I understand the question. Uh, that would, it, would be the case of a, of, of, of a firm renting their facilities to other. No, not really. It would be. Uh, it would of be selling, maybe a firm selling a license? Yeah, it's, it's basically. You were talking about knowledge. So it's, it's a way of uh, licensing knowledge or maybe uh, copywriting the knowledge or something like that. But, but it's not really the, the knowledge itself, it's the, the possibility to use it that's it's being granted. So the, 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 the knowledge of the product that is, that's being produced is not really something that they care about. That's why the uh, large parts of open source uh, the products can be produced even by the capitalist firms. Because they, they don't care if you see the, uh, the code or not. The, the point is that if you want to use it, you have to pay, pay the rent. Uh, and uh, the, the, there is, of course, outside of the capitalist the rationality, there is absolutely no reason why you would pay that rent. You know, it's perfectly fine software that works without it. And uh, but in, if you want to uh, uh, use it to its full potential, for example, uh, uh, on some social network, or uh, if you want to use uh, some app store, that, that then. Uh, Gives you the opportunity to uh, to to, to uh, pull out its full potential. Then you have to pay the rent in one way or the other. So we can discuss uh, the concrete uh, uh, more modes how it happens, but uh, it's basically rent. They are not selling the product. Well, <coughs> rent, as you know, is uh, a simple appropriation of certain value produced by other people. License is a different thing. You produce, um, uh, you develop uh, a mental product, you have a license on it, and you sell it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So if you sell that, uh, the, the firm 
which is willing to buy this license will produce a certain number of uh, material shells of that knowledge. And that at that point you can compute the productivity. Um, I don't see any I don't see any um, uh, objections to uh, the level theory of value in these two examples. So you always have to see it in relation to the material commodities as well. 